I'm Linda Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Many of us can recollect a favorite book from our childhoods. It could be a chapter book we learned to read by ourselves, or maybe a picture book, a story that was read to us and often committed to memory so that we could read along before we could even decipher the words on the page. At some point, we stopped being read to. As adults, we may now read to our children, but there will come a time when we stop reading to them too. My guest today, New York Times Book Review editor, Pamela Paul, believes we are setting aside picture books too soon. Today on EdCash, she joins me for a conversation about the value of picture books across all ages and ways we can encourage children to read. And because we know the joy of being read to, we're going to read some books aloud too, now on EdCast. My guest today is Pamela Paul. She's the editor of the New York Times Book Review and oversees all book coverage at the Times. She's the host of the weekly book review podcast and the author of seven books, including her most recent, Rectangle Time, a picture book. Thank you so much for being with us today on EdCast. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you recently wrote an opinion piece in the Times called Your Kids Aren't Too Old for Picture Books and Neither Are You. Yes. What prompted that piece? You know, I mean, obviously I have my own first picture book out now, Rectangle Time, but this is something constantly on my mind. One of the things I've been doing in quarantine is trying to safely visit local bookstores to help them help support them and also selfishly because I constantly want new books. Um, and I took my youngest child in tow with me. He's 11 years old, so he is not full-time reading picture books. He is reading adult books and children's books um, like most 11 year olds, but um, I still love picture books. So what will end up happening is I will be the one to look at the picture book section while he's looking at novels and pick out ones that I really <laughs> still want to read. So we were in a store recently and I brought home, I bought a book called uh, Marshmallow, which actually is a quite old book. It was a 1942 Caldecott honor book. And I brought it home and I asked him if I could read it to him. So it's really like an inverse of what the normal um, you know, child begging the, the parent to read before bedtime is. And it really dawned on me that that I was the one who wanted to read this book. Um, it's 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 like um, you know, occasionally as a parent, you realize that that there's a role reversal going on, and this was one of those moments. And you know, the other thing is that I do think that when book people in general talk about books and the books that were formative experiences for them, and when I went around the country talking about how to raise a reader, which was my previous um, book. The children's books most people remember tend to be novels. And there's a reason for that. It's not surprising. You know, people remember reading A Wrinkle in Time, or they will remember reading um, The Hobbit, or they'll remember reading Beverly Cleary books. But most people don't immediately jump on picture books. And I was interested to explore why that is and why it is that we don't often, us book people, talk about the genius, in my opinion, <laughs> that is picture books. So why do you think it is still valuable to read a picture book aloud to an older child? It is valuable at every age and it is a pleasure at every age. But I want to explain, you know, perhaps it's easiest to talk about what it is that picture books do that other formats don't necessarily do. And some people don't even know, well, what is a picture book really? What's the difference between a picture book and a, and a chapter book? So the way it progresses is you start off with board books and those are those little, you know, chunky books made of cardboard, sometimes plastic. Um, kids can chew on them and they don't tear. They're, they're, they're very useful. Um, and then you move on to picture books, which is, you know, your sort of standard illustrated book. And I'll just hold up one that most people will recognize, classic, In the Night Kitchen, Maurice Sendak, large format book generally. And then you go on to what are called early readers, which are <laughs> generally boring um, because it's really when kids are learning to sound out words. So the cat sat on the mat, that kind of thing. Um, much more fun if it's, you know, the cat in the hat, but it's generally very simple 
simple, easy words to sound out when you're learning how to read. And from there, you go on to chapter books and then to novels um, and onward, hopefully. Um, but picture books are kind of unique in that they are equally divided between visual and textual storytelling. So you have people like Maurice Sendak, who illustrates and writes the words and creates this work you know, in concert. And then you have people like me who cannot draw to save my life um, and, and writes the book um, and then is paired by an editor with, a, with, a, when, with an illustrator. What happens with a picture book is this kind of magic in that there are two stories being told at once. There's a story that's told through the pictures and there's a story told through the words. And the parent is reading the words while the child is reading the pictures. And that is something, you know, not to be underestimated, the child reads a picture book from a very early age. They are always reading that book. They are seeing the sequence of, of images, which is part, you know, that sort of sequential reading, which is part of learning how to read words as well. And there are also stories embedded within a picture book. So anyone who's read, you know, Good Night Moon knows that, okay, there's the story of Margaret Wiseman Brown's book, which is, you know, in the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon, but they also know there are little mini stories told within that. So there's the mouse that makes his way around the room that you sort notice in the background if you're the child who's looking at the pictures as opposed to the adult who's really looking at the words and there's a picture of in that room the runaway bunny which is uh you know he's the star of another market wise brown book so the child is getting a whole other layer and i think most parent people will recognize this experience of reading aloud a picture book to a child and the child will laugh um, or ask a question that seemingly has nothing to do with the words that you just read. And it's because they are reading an entirely different story while you're reading the words. Now, why do you think that it's valuable then to read a picture book to an older child, to one who could read the book by herself? So if you continue to read picture books to them, you are holding out a carrot to you know, show them, this is where you will eventually get once you have mastered those words, sounding out the, 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 those sort of phonetic uh, combinations. And you also are continuing to reward the act of reading and to motivate them. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, it, it, the other thing about it is that when you think about what the, the opposite um, act would, would imply if you said to your child, oh, now you're learning how to read, so I'm not reading aloud to you anymore. That's punitive, right? And for a lot of children, having that experience of reading picture books with a parent or a caregiver is such an act of, you know, intimacy and, and um, shared pleasure that that's the last moment in which you want to pull picture books away. The other thing I would say, though, is, you know, we often talk about books for all ages, and um, it's rare that books really are for all ages, but there are some that truly are. We happen to be taping this on the morning um, when it was uh, reported that Norman Norton Juster died. He's the author, of course, of The Phantom Tollbooth, which is illustrated by Jules Pfeiffer. Now, um, that's not a picture book, but that truly is a children's book that is for all ages. Any adult who hears that book, reads that book, um, can take pleasure in it. And I would argue that for parents, many picture books, I mean, for me, most picture books, but it's really for the parent too. Now, there are picture books <laughs> that are divisive. There are picture books that your child will like and that you might not necessarily appreciate as much. But the even if you don't enjoy the words of the picture book, you can appreciate the art. That's and the artwork, I would say too, of picture books that are being written today is truly remarkable. I think we're living in a golden age for picture books in this country. Take a moment then and take a look at a picture book that you think would be a, a good book to read aloud to a child who is even a bit older. Can you tell us the book that you have with you? Sure. So um, one of the things that the, the pleasures that transcends all ages is humor. And I think people underestimate how much kids love funny books. They, you know, they, they generally like um, books that are moving. They don't really like books that are sad in the way that, you know, adults like me, for example, I love a book that makes me cry. And um, that's not generally what kids get into, but they love a funny book. So this book is called 
um, can someone please scratch my back? Um, and it's a little bit dark. Uh, it is about an, an elephant. It's by Jory John and it's illustrated by Liz Climo. Liz Climo is a graphic novelist and cartoonist who also writes books for adults. And so, you know, there's a very sophisticated sensibility going on here. And I think frankly, people underestimate children's sophistication. So what this book is about is about an elephant who has an itch on his back. It's just like a totally absurd premise, but of course the elephant is us. And sometimes we all have itches on our backs. And what he does is he proceeds to um, sort of tour the animal kingdom. And there's no rhyme or reason for the animals that he encounters. You know, they're not all jungle animals. They're not all forest animals. They're like, the, all of the sort of, you know, from every corner of the animal world. So there's an air of absurdity to it, but each animal offers to help in a way that is simultaneously useless, pointless, and yet they couldn't do otherwise because it's in their very nature. So to give an example, I'm gonna hold this up, but you can't really see it very well. I will read it to you. So the elephant is saying to the snake, hey, Mr. Snake, can you scratch my back? I don't have any hands. Oh. I forgot. Now, again, a layer of humor for the parent who knows elephants don't forget. I can use my fangs if you want. No, that's okay. Hey, Mr. Bunny, can you, I overheard you from before and I'm happy to oblige. Now I'm going to turn one more page here. How's that? That's not my back. I'm sure you're mistaken the bunny says. So, you know, in here is just so much humor too for the adult because every adult knows that when someone comes along and offers to solve a problem, it's not really necessarily the problem that needs to be solved or they might not understand the problem. And so the bunny and, and the, the kind of the, the, the obtuse insistence of this bunny who is telling the elephant, you know, sort of what's right and what's wrong. Um, and I, I just, I urge anyone to read it. I don't wanna give away the ending, um, but it is, it's full of humor. And I really think that it's one of those books that does what Pixar films do really well, which is that it simultaneously speaks to an adult on one level and to a child perhaps in another level. So it works on different levels. And I think, I suppose that's why people like cartoons. There are many cartoons that work on those double levels. Picture books, as you pointed out, operate on multiple levels. And I'm so glad you pointed out, they really give children a sense of narrative and help them to develop as readers. Now you recently have your own book that just came out called Rectangle Time. And I would love for you, if you wouldn't mind to read the book right now, the whole book, and we'll be able to show our viewers pictures as well. One great thing about picture books is they're generally very short. So um, this is Rectangle Time. Um, it's illustrated by Becky Cameron. Oh good, it's time. They're bringing out the rectangle. I know just what they need. A soft, fluffy, non-rectangular shape to offset those sharp corners and round out the company. You can always count on me for Rectangle Time. Be there in a jiff. Boy, man, Rectangle and me, all the necessary pieces are in place. Here's what I've discovered. Rectangle time usually takes place at night, though sometimes they break out the rectangle during the day too. The man does a lot of talking, but it's a low key activity overall, just the right setting for a fuzzy nuzzle. Watch carefully, see how the man and the boy hold the rectangle together? That means they each have one hand free for me you can tell how much they need me. Sometimes I scratch an itch on the corner of the rectangle. This is how I help make the rectangle feel useful too. Other times I rub my signature scent on the rectangle's edges. This is a form of generosity on my part. We all share in our own ways. Great, it's that time again. Hello, rectangle. Wait a second, this is new. The boy and the man are taking turns holding the rectangle now. That's okay. I'll let whosoever's not holding it stroke my belly. Some cats get prickly about the belly rub, not me. The boy and the man are taking turns talking too. It's nice to have two voices in the mix, but three would be even better. You know, background music. <laughs> Rectangle time. Hmm, something has seriously shifted. What happened to the man? Why is the boy holding the rectangle all by himself? I better go in.
look at that poor little guy. He's just staring at the rectangle alone, quiet, too quiet. Clearly he needs me now more than ever. Wow. That should break up the silence. It feels so good to be helpful. Phew, he still knows what to do with my chin area. I got worried. Yes, that's the spot right there. A, a bit more to the left, please. To the left. Yow. Eh, no big deal. It wasn't on purpose. I get it. Hmm, that rectangle is awfully small. No wonder he has to stare at it so hard. I must be outside his field of vision. I'll just let him know I'm ready. We all need little reminders sometimes. We, what? I'm going to, going to assume that was an accident. Ahoy, there's that undersized rectangle again. I'll make things right this time. Sorry to keep you waiting. Sweet, fluffy, and very much cuddly object at your service. He seems seriously distracted. I'll move a little closer since it's just the two of us these days. I will enhance your rectangle. Ah, there we go. Now that was not an accident. I must be positioning myself wrong. Maybe softly shaped fluffy objects don't belong on top of rectangles after all. Maybe they belong on top of other irregularly shaped fluffy objects. There, that's better. We can still call it rectangle time. The end. <laughs> that is such a charming story about the value of books, the value of being read to. I mean, it really says it all right there. And I wanna thank you for reading that to us because there are not many TV shows for adults where people can have a picture book read to them. So thank you very much. I wanna go back then to the other book you wrote, How to Raise a Reader, one of the other books that you've written. I wanna go over that book a little bit because it has wonderful tips in it and suggestions and book lists. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how can we encourage children to read? I know you divide the book by age groups, which is really wonderful. So let me focus a little bit on that middle age group where kids begin to say they don't wanna read so much. What can we do to encourage them? Right, well, this scares parents a lot, right? And I think it's especially scary these days in general, and right now during the pandemic, maybe even more so, because what are kids doing instead? Right now they're on screens in sort of real world times, <laughs> post-pandemic, pre-pandemic times. Um, what they are doing is they are also on screens, um, but they are also doing a million extracurricular activities. They're doing homework. Their time is really, you know, very highly scheduled. And during their leisure times, they have a ton of choices. So it's not like when I was growing up and I would come home from school and you'd have a kind of choice of like Gilligan's Island or the Brady Bunch. These kids have every channel available to them. They have every video game on multiple platforms. They have every app. They have all of social media. So they have many choices. Here's what you have to remember. A child will only read during this precious leisure time if they want to read. So you need to employ all of the parental sort of mind game tricks. Really, a lot of it is psychological. Don't listen, kids, to this. Um, but it, it, it's about trying to instill in your children intrinsic motivation to read, not extrinsic motivation. You don't want to say to your child, you know, um, if you read that book, you'll get, you know, an hour of iPad time. Because then you're saying to the child, this is the obligatory, not fun thing to do that you have to do in order to get to do the fun thing. It's the opposite of the message. So what you want to do is really a, sort of instill in your children. And I know this sounds uh, harder. <laughs> it, it's not necessarily obvious how to do this, although the book is, is full of tips. But what you're trying to do is to instill an, a love of children, of reading in children, a pleasure in children, so that children choose to read because they want to read. Doing it the other way around is never going to lead to someone or, you know, <laughs> probably not going to lead to someone who chooses to read and becomes a lifelong reader, which is your ultimate goal. And do you recommend um, allowing or encouraging children, emerging readers, independent readers to select whatever they want? 
Absolutely. No judgment. No judgment. Why would you, if your child picks up a book and is thoroughly enjoying it, say, that's not a real book. <laughs> Why are you reading that book? Any book that your child is reading, whether it's like a book of fart jokes or sports facts or a dogman book is a book. And if they are choosing it and they have agency in, in, in that process, it may reflect something and that, that is about them and is giving them pleasure. The last thing you want to do is issue any kind of judgment. And look, when I was a kid, I read Betty and Veronica comics, never Jughead. Um, I read, you know, Peanuts. I read Sweet Dream Romances. I read all kinds of really what one would call not great literature. And it did not prevent me from growing up to become someone who, you know, will read Dostoevsky or, you know, Toni Morrison in my spare time. I'm going to take advantage of having you here. I mean, I also teach a children's literature class at the college. And I, love, I have written two children's books myself. You know, I love children's books, obviously. So the problem novel, the YA novel, I want to take a minute and talk about the YA novel. Some people feel it's gotten too realistic. I mean, beginning with the outsiders. I mean, these are stories that more and more are really dealing with real life issues in very visceral ways. Yeah. Some educators are thinking maybe they've gone too far for the age group. What's your, do you, what's your take on that? Here's the truth. It may be too realistic for some readers, but for other readers, it's probably a vital message, something that makes them feel heard or seen. And so I think as with adult books, the wider variety of books that are available, the better it is. Should every child necessarily read every single book? No. Um, but for those children who are going through a difficult experience or who maybe feel isolated in their community or who are a curiosity about something, I would so much rather they read about that experience in a book than that they encounter it in a totally decontextualized way on the internet or on social media or in some place where it hasn't been read over by educators, it hasn't been sensitively edited, it hasn't been you know, carefully calibrated for that age group. And I think about this, you know, on, honestly, too, when you get back to picture books for a moment. So there are some picture books that deal with grief and losing a parent. Um, that's really tough. That's a really tough subject for a lot of kids. But imagine what a picture book about losing your mother is like for a five-year-old girl who's just lost her mother. That is a book that will probably be incredibly meaningful to her and will really make her feel like someone out there knows her, understands what she's going through and that, and that pain. So I feel the same way about, about YA books. One thing I do think is that you know, a lot of YA books doesn't they don't necessarily need to be assigned in school to every child in the, you know, every teenager in the classroom. A lot of the YA books that might be very specific to one kind of experience or another are the kinds of books that kids can seek out or that a really great librarian can recommend or a teacher can recommend for that child. You know, every child is different in terms of their, their taste and interest in books in the same way that all adults are different in our taste and interest in books. So I, I, I do think that it's important that those books be published and be available, even if they're not necessarily right for every single reader. I think that's an excellent point. And I thank you for bringing that up because the five-year-old, you would buy that picture book for a child who's lost a parent. You might not read that book to every five-year-old. But the YA novel that are, that's out there, if it is assigned to a class, then everybody's reading it, whether it's appropriate for them or not. I also want to ask you quickly, do you have a feeling about digital books versus books in print? And um, should little, you know, at what age? Or do you think it doesn't matter age? What's your feeling about that? So I don't have a feeling, I have a thinking, <laughs> which is that there really is no advantage to it whatsoever and every disadvantage, at least according to the available research that I find trustworthy and reliable, which shows that what I think will be really intuitive for a lot of adults, and that is kids tend to absorb 
and retain information better when it's on a printed page as opposed to when it's on a screen. And when it's on a screen, even if it is completely uninterrupted by notifications and all of that, our brains when we are thinking, when we are looking at a screen, go into screen mode, which is attentiveness, kind of nervousness, looking around the edges, thinking like what's coming next, the knowledge that you could just go to another tab, you could leave this page and go somewhere else that might be a little bit more interesting. Whereas when you're with a book, especially if there are no screens or phones in the room, you are immersed. And it's that kind of immersive quality of literature, of storytelling that a book offers that no other medium offers. It's because with a book, for example, as opposed to a movie adaptation of a book, the reader is, is, is writing the story as much as she is reading it. You are imagining what a character's voice sounds like. You are using the words to create an image in your mind of what a setting looks like, of what a character looks like. And in a film, for example, or on TV or on a screen, that's being delivered for you, to you. So it's that act of being alone with a book, creating that story that I think makes novels and you know, narrative nonfiction, whatever it is that we're reading, really stay with us as a, as a, as a, as a kind of um, means of information and entertainment beyond what any other storytelling medium can do. We are completely out of time, so I just want to... Thank you so much. And I want to remind viewers of a line you have in one of your books, the right book at the right time. And I think that that's really wonderful advice for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pamela Paul, book editor at the New York Times. And um, thank you again. And looking forward to reading more of the books that you write as well. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this edition of EdCast. See you next time. While finalizing this show on the pleasures of picture books, we were saddened to hear of the passing of renowned children's book author Beverly Cleary at age 104. A prolific writer, her first book, Henry Huggins, was published in 1950. She ushered in a more realistic portrayal of children in literature, depicting them in all their messy glory, sensitive, funny, confused by adults, tormented by siblings, and yet so often triumphant. Beverly Cleary inspired me as a young reader and later as an author of children's books. I remember many Friday afternoons at the Fort Washington Library in Washington Heights, scouring the shelves for her books for weekend reading. Beezus and Ramona was a favorite. There is a universality to Cleary's characters who mirror so well the real throes of childhood. Ramona's travails were also not lost on my urban community college students who celebrated Cleary's 100th birthday by reading Ramona Quimby, age eight. The books we enjoyed as children can stay with us forever. Today's EdCast reminds us that we never outgrow picture books and we're never too old to read Ramona the Pest. <laughs>